take this opportunity to uh, thank both of, uh, both of the host and myself uh, for the exhibition upstairs that I know uh, a lot of you have already uh, seen, which uh, I think uh, demonstrates one of the uh, uh, talent's interest in terms of the interface between uh, the uh, uh, computers and, uh, and architecture. That, that moment when, uh, as they describe in, in one of their texts, the kind of instrumentality of the, of the computer also becomes engaged with certain spatial possibilities. So that it really goes beyond the kind of normative conventional ways in which uh, the computer is used in many instances in terms of their kind of uh, speedy reproductive possibilities, but more in terms of how the conceptual possibilities that are inherent in the system itself can really be part of the thinking uh, that becomes engaged with the architectural project. So I would like to thank them for that. I would like to ask uh, Zaha maybe to, uh, to say a few words to them. I feel very bad doing this because Maxon has displayed upstairs incredible ability of making an imitation of me. So his new career as a kind of uh, some other some other being is uh, in the uh, cut up. We can do that one of these days, you know. Anyhow, um, I, I, I usually hate doing um, imitation of an introduction, which is to read somebody's CV, so I'm improvising as usual. Uh, I've known Bill Shinan Bill for much longer, and he just reminded me, I was trying to skip this part uh, by reminding him that I'm on a day A 20 years ago. Uh, he was the first generation of students I had in the AA, and he reminded me as going down the stairs that the door to the terrace was the toilet, and I said it still is. Uh, but I, know them, uh, I met him on my first day of teaching and they, when I was um, uh, a beginner, and he called me Professor Hadid and I almost died at the bar. <laughs> uh, that idea. Uh, and so uh, I've had a kind of have a special affection for him because of this degree of respect he held for me. Uh, but he was, he was not a very nice boy, uh, young and, um, and I'm always reminded of this uh, uh, incredible sweetness he displayed when he was at school. And things have changed since then. And I'm not sure that since he met Shannon or before, but definitely there has been a radical shift in his, uh, in his um, anyway, he is still a wonderful guy. And, um, and, uh, and Shannon is, I met her around maybe now 12 years ago. Uh, at Columbia, and um, apart from my really interest in their work, they have been tremendous friends of mine, incredible, uh, you know, for loyalty, and also they are very rare that they spend a whole day in New York City without getting other totally depressed or hysterical. So I, as part of my kind of uh, really um, um, sort of uh, a, com uh, a tonic when I go to New York, I do spend a day with them, and it's also quite, well, it's very enjoyable because you can actually talk about many things without being kind of, kind of personal and hysterical, and then also you can do what we do sometimes with go schlopping, which is um, another kind of cure uh, for some people. Uh, <laughs> but my interest also in their work, which is that also it's very rare that, it, that it's um, employed that the connection between technology in terms of digital and architecture, in their case, I think what is interesting about it is that it's, it doesn't rely on the machine to actually, um, to kind of really do what the hand in theory cannot do. They have a particular also interest in the in the kind of really refinement of the object making in the sense that their interest is also not in terms of the craft, but I think in the craft of technology, but also in the craft of making these things. So I think there's equal interest in how to really kind of uh, uh, for, formulate in a kind of digital way, in the same way how these things are built to reflect the way, in a sense, they are also reproduced, in a, in a, in a, whether it is by hand or it is by the, by the use of technology. I was on a jury many years ago at the um, one of my favorite place of mine, New York, uh, the Urban League, uh, which uh, they used to do, or maybe they still do, a uh, kind of um, promising young designers, architects, uh, juries. They still do this uh, thing, whatever it's called. Uh, it was then called 30 Under 30, it goes up every few years to go and 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 then I think it was one of the first early collaborations. I could be also wrong about that. One of the early collaborations, and it was also they won an award for it. And in a sense, although in in, in um, uh, superficially it seems that the work has changed a great deal, but I think the interests have remained the same. But they have kind of really grown up uh, with them, and also with the kind of also introductions of different things, which uh, I, I'm sure they will 
go through that. Anyway, I just want to welcome them to the AA, which I've always thought is a you know, place I belong to, but also they belong to in an indirect way. I want to welcome them here, and uh, I hope you all join me in doing the same. Thank you. for inviting us. It's indeed a pleasure to be here and um, uh, I don't know uh, how to uh, reciprocate Zaha's introduction. It's very hard to do. Uh, uh, suffice it to say that um, I, um, I doubt that if Moisen had done invitation of it, it would be, uh, would have been half as entertaining. Um, we are going to uh, split the lecture. I'm going to start off and we're going to show a series of um, projects that are um, quite uh, varying sizes and situations. Uh, and um, inevitably, I'm also going to start off with um, a, a brief reading, actually, of some um, sort of ideas that um, many of the projects um, go back to or, or are um, sort of inspired by. So, uh, but I promise to keep, keep it brief, and, um, and I hope that um, you know, you'll be um, um, entertained throughout. Um, I actually, it would be good, I think, to have the first slide up there. Um, you oh, I can, yes. Sorry. Um, the collaborative projects selected for this lecture are of entirely different scales and situations, with each one addressing a series of issues. Observed together, they reflect our interest in the implications of new technologies on the discipline of architecture. Due to the computer's paradoxical capacity of being simultaneously instrumental and spatial, its inception into the field of architecture begs for a re-evaluation of pre-existing design methodologies and of inherited notions as to the nature, of, nature and limitations of space. The projects each explore this ambiguity to varying degrees and with varying emphasis on program and morphology. One of the emerging spatial paradigms is that of the network as a system of interrelations between dissipative processes and aggregative structures that shape new spatial patterns and protocols. How does this network logic affect space and its making? Our, focus, our work focuses in particular on the network model's capacity to facilitate cross-categorical and cross-scalar couplings, whereby the initial systems and morphologies are not merely interconnected, but form new hybrid identities. What differentiates this new generation of chimerical hybrids from previous mechanistic ones is the act of transformation. These new systems are not determined and cannot be understood through a logical extension of the initial parts alone. They are hybrid, but nonetheless seamlessly and inextricably continuous. The two specific models of the network and the hybrid that are of interest here are the co-citation map and the aforementioned chimera. Now, what you see uh, as in the first slide is actually uh, one co-citation map. Um, and uh, the, the following is a kind of a brief description of how these things um, operate and what the underlying logic of, of them are. Or is. <clears throat> this is a form of electronic indexing and information retrieval based on co-citation. The principle underlying co-citation indexing is as follows. If one paper cites an earlier publication, they bear a conceptual relationship to one another. The references given in a publication thus serve to link that publication to earlier knowledge. Implicit in these linkages is a relatedness of intellectual content. In reordering the literature by works cited, we obtain a citation index. As an index, it works according to a similar principle as any keyword-based library search listing all work related to the same keyword, and thus revealing non-apparent conceptual connections across categories such as humanities and science, for example. And there you can actually, um, I'm sort of oblique to it, but you, you can sort of see these uh, major category clusters. Uh, uh, I can't really see, but this is, seems to be a kind of science cluster, and then there's sort of, this is sociology. Uh, and, and, and there are sort of all this is psychology, I believe, and, and they're all <coughs> uh, uh, interconnected through these co-citations. Interestingly, the next level of organization is constructed as a map, a geographic description of relational knowledge. In this kind of map, 
Groups of co-cited papers are organized in clusters, each cluster representing a network of interrelated co-cited publications. There are five iterations of increasing levels of networks in all. What is achieved in clustering is a matrix of objects linked together by varying degrees and in different states of aggregation. The graphic tool used for these maps is known as similarity mapping. These maps have no absolute axis. Instead, their spatial organization is based on continually becoming hierarchies, which are contingent upon frequency of citation, and thus subject to change over time. Next slide, please. Um, now, this is probably um, uh, an image that you work, or at least the artist uh, uh, who created this image you know. Uh, it's Nancy Burson, and it, this particular one is called Warheads 2. Uh, and uh, what was of interest to us here is the fact that this is a kind of composite portrait, which was prorated um, uh, according to the number of, uh, the, the, the head, it's a portrait of composite heads of state. Uh, at the time that uh, this project was made, uh, it was prorated to the number of war, nuclear warheads that each one of these countries possessed. So it's a combined, combined image, actually, of uh, Reagan, Brezhnev, Mitterrand, Deng, and Thatcher. <laughs> and, uh, and this is sort of, um, this has been a haunting uh, image for us for some time because uh, it, it seems to get, um, to the core of this notion of, uh, that we're interested in, of this notion of chimera, which is a kind of uh, organic hybrid in which uh, the original identities no longer uh, are uh, separable or, or distinguishable, but in fact, uh, the composite forms its own identity. And the chimera <coughs> is the proper name given to a mythological monster, the supreme hybrid, constituted of part lion, part goat, part snake. While the term chimera without the article, also referred to as mosaicism, <coughs> denotes a pathological condition which occurs either spontaneously or is produced artificially, and in which individuals are composed of diverse genetic parts. Robert Rosen, in his essay on cooperation in chimera, notes that chimera formation, in which a new individual or a new identity arises out of other, initially independent individuals, is a kind of inverse process to differentiation in which a single initial individual spawns many diverse individuals, or in which one part of a single individual becomes different from other parts. If one replaces individual with system in the above statement, it becomes possible to situate the concept of chimera outside the realm of biology. In fact, Rosen goes on to assert that ecosystems and man-machine interactions are chimerical. The chimerical differs in crucial ways from other forms of hybrid systems such as collage, montage, or the prosthetic. While the latter are also systems in which the diverse parts operate together, these parts never lose their individual identities. In fact, the individual identity of each part, i.e. the categorical difference, is more pronounced in systems based on, st on strategies of juxtaposition or su superimposition. And because each part exists as a discrete entity linked to other discrete entities, the whole can be taken apart. And the idea of irreversible, irreducible hybridity, both as a concept and product, would not have been thinkable within the paradigm of mechanics to which the techniques of collage and montage are linked. So uh, as such, the, the chimera is an organic hybrid, which is not necessarily a, a reference to uh, a, a kind of formal appearance in terms of the organic, but, uh, but rather uh, organic as opposed to mechanic, which means that uh, it's not only a, a describing a functional unity, but also a structural unity, which is quite uh, an important distinction. In a chimera, the relationship between the constituent parts is not one of interconnection or adjacency, at least not simply. The limits of the parts, the exact delineations of the thresholds between parts, are not clearly identifiable. Rather, like the result of a successful graft, the border disappears. Locally, the part which was different becomes inextricably bonded with the rest. One of the perhaps most interesting aspects of the concept of chimera occurs at a systemic level, namely its ability to produce entirely new systems out of multiple hybrid configurations. 
These new systems are not determined and cannot be understood through a logical extension of the initial parts only. Finally, and as a consequence of the first two points, a third aspect of the chimerical is that it is not reducible to its constitu constituent parts. We have two primary interests in the chimerical. One has to do with its seeming capability as a concept to help define existing phenomena of fairly complex hybridity in which categorically different systems somehow operate as a single identity. The other is based on the assumption that the ways in which chimera are constituted and operate hold clues to a transformatively aggregative model of construction and production. That is to say, an aggregation which becomes more than the sum of its parts and therefore is not reducible to its constituent parts. Thus, the chimerical has the potential to be both an analytical and methodological tool. In combination, the two models offer an opportunity, the two models of the co-citation and the chimera, offer an opportunity to link dissipative and aggregative operations to transformative ones, with the co-citation analog identifying similarities between unrelated sites, structures, and programs, and the chimerical analog employing these initial similarities to construct new sites, structures, and programs. This attempt at constructing a methodology takes its cues both from particular logics of the computer as well as, a certain, as certain urban default conditions that we see as happening presently. As existing building types and corresponding program entities are pulled apart through the combined effects of transportation and communication, the clusters emerging by way of this process can remain unattached, free agents as it were, or re-aggregate, driven by opportunity or pragmatism, in unprecedented ways into new composite entities. It is through transformative operations that the aggregation of distinct parts obtains the qualities of continuity without necessarily again becoming a totalizing whole. Uh, okay, with that, um, I can push this. Uh, I'm going to start uh, with the first project. This is uh, a project that was actually part of a, uh, an exhibition in the, uh, an art gallery in Soho, uh, in which uh, different parties, uh, mostly artists, who were the only architects, were invited to um, contribute uh, um, parts uh, to. And we actually were given um, some uh, sort of very vague term to work with. Uh, it was called a vehicle. We were asked to do vehicles. And um, we, we thought that actually this was um, a, in some ways an interesting term because, um, we, again, in terms of our interest in both the um, uh, transportation and uh, communication uh, issues and the pro proliferation of vehicles attached to uh, those two realms, um, we thought that this might become a kind of abstract investigation of, of some of those aspects. And, uh, what, what became interesting is that in both those realms, um, uh, there, there are certain similarities. Um, the, the accoutrements that come uh, as with these realms as vehicles uh, have show certain sort of similarities. First of all, they all um, are hollow, so they have some degree of uh, uh, interiority. Uh, secondly, um, they all seem to also have common a certain molded morphology, which has uh, partially to do with the fact uh, that they need that morphology, morphology to be able to transport. It has partly to do with the means of uh, production uh, that they come from. Uh, it has um, also partly to do uh, with the fact that they, they are close to the body, so they have some anthropomorphic qualities. Um, and the other, uh, the, I think the, the fourth issue, which is also an important one, is that uh, they tend to be fairly small scale. Um, they, they tend to be produced in uh, large quantities, and they tend to be tied to each other and to other things and systems through very, very large structures. Um, for instance, uh, I mean, comp computers is an obvious one through the web, uh, telephones, uh, cars through uh, highway structures, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, <coughs> uh, one of the, um, here you see a series of them. Um, we, we, uh, we produce them, and you, you, you're going to see some of the other images also that uh, show um, 
notions of similarity mappings, but we, we uh, produce them uh, uh, in a way similar to, to what I was describing uh, in the co-citation model and the chimera model, in that we took uh, existing um, um, pieces of vehicles uh, and similarity mapped them and, and combined them to, to uh, come up with these uh, composite uh, hybrid vehicles, which, um, which didn't have any assigned function. Uh, the notion was that the function would be uh, invented in relation to their um, performance value at various scales and uh, in varying circumstances. Um, the other um, notion was to play actually with the issue of uh, scalelessness. Uh, in other words, each one, we, we use each one of these pieces in, uh, in multiple scales uh, and in, in ways that are self-similar. So there are sort of very subtle variations. Uh, most of them have actually two, two different generations. There are uh, always pairs that are somewhat related to each other. Um, and uh, it was interesting to us um, to explore this issue of uh, scalelessness uh, because it's also something that um, the com computer, uh, these certain software programs uh, bring up as a, as a problematic because there isn't immediately a scale to it. Uh, it's, not, um, it's not very similar to a kind of traditional way of working where when you sit down to draw, you assign scale to the plan that you're going to draw. Uh, but when you're working with 3D modeling software, um, Initially, um, there, there is no um, there is no logical scale to it in any way. Um, so we decided to to work with this notion to distinguish between size and scale. That is, size uh, meaning that it would be a quantitative description of the, the material uh, thing itself, and scale would be something that uh, could vary depending on, uh, as I was saying before, the, the context uh, that these pieces were in. And so and this, this is actually a diagram that we did, which shows, which is, uh, uh, appears to be a perspective, but it isn't a perspective, actually. Uh, so these things, uh, they're uh, in, in the right relational uh, scale to each other. In other words, um, you can see here many of the pieces repeated in, in varying scales, and um, they actually, um, um, it's, it's, the, it's the real ratio, and it's not because of distance. Um, here now a series of, uh, we also produced, um, we, these pieces were produced uh, in real life, um, we, we did some uh, digital uh, uh, um, versions of them and then we also produced a kind of uh, what we call a vehicle manual, uh, which was somewhat of a um, speculative manual uh, with uh, instruction, with sort of very vague instructions as to uh, how to possibly um, um, program these pieces, but also uh, it was accompanied by a series of images um, that uh, indicated uh, in which ways these were similarity mapped uh, and from, from what other types of pieces. So here you see computer mice and um, t uh, telephones and so on that were um, mapped according to um, their physical quality. Um, and then here the final pieces were then again uh, mapped to similar, according to similar criteria. This being uh, sphericity, uh, this is for roundedness, uh, this one is for elongation. These criteria, by the way, uh, came out of, um, uh, uh, there are studies for powder par particles, uh, which is very interesting because they are abstract particles, not unlike these, uh, and they're, they're tested for their uh, varying performance values with regard to these kinds of uh, criteria. So uh, we, we uh, adapted some of these criteria for these pieces. This is angularity. Uh, this is the uh, total surface area of the pieces. Uh, and then we also went uh, inside the objects and did, did a series of films. They're also upstairs on the monitor for those of you who are interested. Uh, and these are some stills from those uh, internal video films. Uh, we would have very much liked to build one of these interiors uh, or one of these objects at occupiable scale, but uh, there was um, unfortunately not necessarily a large enough budget for it. So we had actually uh, 
a room in which uh, these were projected and it was sort of set up in such a way that you could um, somehow simulate the experience of being in those spaces. Um, and here, um, now the pieces themselves, they were, um, and these big ones were actually, the molds for these were done on CNC machines uh, and then they were uh, covered in uh, fiberglass and they, they each were produced in different colors. Uh, the smaller ones, uh, this is a very small one. By the way, the sizes were uh, a meter uh, to uh, nine inches, which is a, a little over 20 centimeters, to uh, three inches, uh, which is a little under 10 centimeters. Um, and the small ones were, the molds for these small ones were produced on, um, uh, with stereolithography. And then uh, rubber molds were made from those, and th those were then um, cast in fiberglass again. Oh, I'm sorry. because, uh, in fact, we m manipulated the scale in each one of these cases. This does not necessarily mean that any of these pieces were produced at that scale. Um, and this becomes particularly apparent with this, this one. Um, the piece here, of course, was um, a nine-inch piece, um, but in terms of its morphology, um, it could have been also read, and this was one of the issues about scale, uh, as a kind of uh, small-scale model of essentially something much larger and perhaps aerodynamic. Um. Uh, which uh, then generates uh, 
the, the new house. Um, and it's essentially, again, here, when you think about, of course, the landscape and the house, there is, there is not, there are two completely different categories. There, there is nothing um, initially very similar about them. But when you actually think about them as sort of a series of, in both cases, uh, surfaces uh, with sort of uh, ridges and, and valleys and so on. Uh, in, in one case, there's a kind of strict planarity. In the other one, the surfaces are allowed to be uh, warped. Um, you are beginning to see uh, ways of uh, merging the two. And so, uh, as you can see here, for instance, uh, the way that the new house um, um, attaches is by, by a, a way of the dormer. There's an existing small dormer in the back and which, which kind of uh, sponsors this new dormer that then becomes uh, the connection to the new tract. Um, and so there, there is initially a, uh, an attempt to then uh, continue the, the landscape and the house via this, via this new house. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, we thought then in turn it might become interesting to uh, begin to uh, repeat uh, and sort of simulate parts of the new house then across the landscape and remake uh, parts of the landscape as well. And these are sort of locations now, these new brown pieces that you see are locations for um, uh, variations within the, new, within the old landscape that, uh, that actually are um, co-siding aspects of the new house. Um, and here, it's actually upside down, I apologize for that, but it's actually reversed. But um, here is the new house, and these are those pieces. Mm -hmm. And um, what is now becoming interesting at this stage for us is also that in terms of construction, uh, the landscape is going to play a, a, a significant role in the making of the new house, because we're thinking of uh, making the house uh, in concrete panels. And the concrete uh, will be, the landscape uh, pieces uh, will be made exactly to the specifications of some of these surfaces. And so the concrete then, uh, the landscape will be used as a mold for the concrete, which will be cast on the ground and then tilted up and um, used to build the house. This would also mean that in the later stages, we've, we've been asked to do some other smaller additions across the, um, property that we would be able to use the, the very same landscape molds uh, with some perhaps modifications to them uh, to cast more pieces from them. Uh, this is a close-up again. Um, the, the blue ones, in case you were wondering, are actually existing boulders and rocks uh, within the landscape. Um, this is now a series of slides uh, that uh, will show uh, the house from sort of uh, varying uh, viewpoints. This is an aerial view, it's, it's becoming obvious now. This is a view across from the roof of the old house. Uh, that's the, the dormer situation that I was describing before. Um, and this is, this is actually the, the lower terrace with entry. That's, that's the entry to the house from, from the upper level. Um, there is also, uh, there are these series of uh, terraces that um, connect uh, from the interior to the exterior of the house and they will all be simultaneously cast on ground uh, as um, you can see the with a later image. But uh, anyway, so this is a lower, this is now from the lower garden. Um, this is around the corner. This is an older version without the exterior uh, terraces. And this is again turning the corner further. Um, this is sort of now from the, uh, from the far furthermost portion. This is looking down from the hill onto uh, the new house with the old house here, and that's that dormant situation. Um, also, the, the way um, because these surfaces are actually uh, varying continually, both in plan and section, um, uh, we were sort of uh, thinking about uh, strategies as to how to kind of um, describe this as a set of drawings and understand also the, the internal uh, 
qualities of it. And so these are a series of uh, section cuts, actually, at every two feet uh, from top to bottom that show uh, the vari variation of the spaces. Um, basically, m most of it is open uh, living area uh, with only uh, this corner being a kind of double stacked uh, bathroom, bedroom arrangement. Um, this is sort of a diagrammatic plan. This is the upper uh, bedroom bathroom. These have changed, by the way, by now, but that's sort of uh, roughly still the configuration uh, with a kind of ramp down. This is the entry level. Uh, this is the first uh, <coughs> living room area. This is then open to the second one. And this is the lower bedroom with bathroom. <coughs> They're also older, but uh, anyway, they show uh, the kind of double stacking. This is the living room area, these are the bedrooms. Uh, this is the, the portion that connects the old house to the new house with the um, entry lending. Uh, here again, you, you arrive here, and this is a kind of uh, all open living room area with these two bedrooms. that interested us in concrete uh, was also the reason why we were interested in fiberglass, which is the project that we were going to see built. Um, it, it somehow, uh, there, there are two aspects to it. One is that it has the ability to be both uh, structural as well as enclosure, uh, all in one, uh, just by kind of varying uh, uh, thickness or, or varying structural ability. And the other is also that it, it's, it's kind of um, almost indiscriminating uh, quality of uh, being able to uh, assume uh, any kind of form, which becomes uh, interesting in the context of um, this issue of chimera. This was an earlier uh, version. This is a kind of force diagram across the skin, actually. Uh, and at this point, we were uh, considering a, a, a timber version of it. Um, this is how um, it would be constructed. These are basically, except for the, the, the upper bedroom, everything is uh, on, on ground. Uh, the, sort of the, the interior of the house therefore becomes uh, very much a kind of uh, continuation of the existing garden surfaces. So this is the exterior terrace with the, the entry. All of this is uh, cast on ground. The stairs are cast on ground. Uh, this is the lower sitting area with its outdoor portion. Uh, then again, stairs, the, uh, I'm sorry, that was the upper sitting area, lower sitting area with its outdoor portion, uh, and the lower bedroom uh, and its terrace. And, and these are a series of uh, slides that um, we gave out to contractors, believe it or not, um, so that they could visualize uh, how we would suggest uh, constructing this, which is that, first of all, this, the, all the ground would be cast, and then these panels that were cast on ground, as you were seeing in the initial uh, uh, landscape slides, and would be tilted up one by one uh, until the whole thing is enclosed. And then there, there has to be a special connection to the wood portion of the old house. And these are a series of slides now, now that show just the shell. Um, Before, by the way, I just noticed it's upside down, I'm sorry. 
Uh, but that's okay. I'm sure you're so over familiar with this side that it doesn't matter. Uh, it's uh, Yokohama. It's the competition, uh, and uh, there is um, the pier. And then the other project um, that sort of came uh, slightly after that was. Is it unfocused or is it just me? Is um, a project we were, a proposal we were uh, asked to do for Fifth Avenue in New York. Um, there were sort of, uh, again, a uh, larger group of uh, architects and artists and landscape uh, architects and so on. They were invited by the Municipal um, Society of New York to do uh, proposals for future development on Fifth Avenue. And it was very open-ended. One could do a large-scale urban projects, or one could design uh, street lamps. Uh, and of course, we went for the for the uh, former. Uh, so, <coughs> and what is in, what is co connecting this project to the Yokohama project is sort of an interest um, in uh, horizontal, large-scale horizontal uh, urban structures. And in that sense, uh, this, the sites are similar, or uh, the pier is obvious. And as far as Manhattan is concerned, uh, we were interested in bringing uh, some degree of that horizontality into Manhattan because um, it's actually sorely lacking. Uh, it. And there's, of course, Central Park, which is one of the main uh, horizontal spaces that's also public. And I think that's, in some ways, that's a kind of undercurrent when, when one is looking for horizontal uh, expanses in the city, in, in most cases they, have, they happen to have some kind of public component also. <clears throat> and then, uh, of course, along the water's edges there are also piers um, and the like. Uh, and there is the Intrepid, uh, which, is, which is sort of one kind of surface like that. Um, this is one of the piers which has tennis courts in it. Um, this is the top of um, one of the World Trade Center towers. Oh, I think it's the... It's so, it's not the next castle. Um, but in both cases, what, uh, what we were trying to um, look for um, was a, probably uh, another kind of model for the horizontal, um, the large horizontal uh, structure. Because that's the wrong kind of selection. Um, because it seems that the current model is one of the, the large container. Uh, so it's a kind of um, big banal container uh, in which anything uh, can happen inside. And uh, we were trying to see if we could uh, probably develop uh, other kinds of models for that type of structure. Uh, and <clears throat> one of the things um, that sort of be we began to experiment with and, and, and later on generated uh, both the structure for Yokohama as well as New York uh, was something called uh, Smith's Horseshoe Transformations. And this is actually a, 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 an interesting chaotic model, but what is interesting about it is um, that uh, the, in each one of the transformations, and we make the transformations by, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, actually uh, taking a sort of um, particular uh, swatch and uh, or surface or topology, whatever you want to call it, uh, you you pull it, you you turn it around as in a kind of horseshoe form, uh, and then uh, so that's the kind of the initial one pulled and then flipped over again, which constitutes the new one, and then you do the same operation over and over again, and so you see sort of uh, what is developing out of it. And um, what, what we thought was interesting about this is um, th the fact that it's becoming sort of a very horizontally uh, uh, complex and, and re-embedded space, but also uh, in terms of um, what, is, what is interesting, um, I guess, to mathematicians and became interesting to us in a different com context was the fact that uh, there is something happening in here which is called tra neighborhood transformations, and that's actually uh, not an architectural term that we're su superimposed, but it, it is uh, used in the mathematical context. Anyway, um, what is happening is that uh, any two points selected in, in each one of the uh, swatches over here um, changes its location uh, during this transformation. And, and the change in location 
is uh, rather unpredictable. But uh, what, we, what we thought was interesting about this is if we actually uh, employed uh, some of these uh, digital uh, sections or these digi digital uh, swatches, S sections, let's say, as abstract <coughs> sections, then uh, we could, uh, first of all, codify them uh, in terms of program, and we could also codify them in terms of interiority and exteriority. Um, so in terms of programs, each section, then these, these were sort of uh, abstract, assumed to be abstract sections, each section would actually hold um, all the programs that were given initially, which would mean that um, at any given point in the building, uh, there's a presence of each one of the program components. But the, the, the relationship, these neighborhood changes, uh, would facilitate continually changing relationships between the spaces and the programs. So they would be sometimes adjacent and sometimes uh, non-adjacent. And they would also uh, drastically change their uh, spatial configurations. Um, and the other thing is that 50% of the program given here was exterior. So in the, in the initial codification of these as sections, we also assign uh, interior and exterior um, areas, which uh, then, uh, like the programs, keep continually changing their uh, both uh, formal configurations as well as their adjacencies to other programs. Um, so the, the connection then uh, between those uh, sections generated uh, something uh, of the sort. Um, and these, there's, the, the, this is sort of a top view of uh, the uh, final uh, product. There, there were three levels, uh, and actually there's also three colors, although the colors uh, are continuous through uh, all three levels. And they would, we were assuming that they would uh, have some kind of probably a structural or material codification so that you would um, be able to recognize them as continuing through those levels. Um, this is a, that was a, the top view of the terrace. This is a lower section. Um, and this is a kind of parking. This is the low section which involves um, mostly um, uh, areas for buses and parking. Um, another thing that um, came out of this operation, which we found very interesting, was um, that <clears throat> unlike a, a kind of traditional uh, approach in which, again, you sort of prioritize the plan and then construct everything up from the ground, uh, and the sections then become a kind of registration of certain instances within the building, uh, once the plan organization is set, in, in, and so therefore you also then get uh, categoric differences, of course, between plan and section. In this case, however, uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, a categorical difference, but, but more a kind of incremental difference, uh, which you can see here in these sections, which are sort of cut, uh, starting from zero degrees to uh, uh, all the way up to 81 degrees through the building, uh, because most of the surfaces are actually um, uh, not, not uh, horizontal, but they are at, at some kind of um, uh, diagonal, and, and therefore um, that's one of the reasons why you're getting this continual transformative change. Um, uh, and again, um, w what I was saying for the concrete was uh, before was, is also a bit of an interest, was a bit of an interest here, uh, in the sense that the what, what, the material that we were getting, which we were then reinterpreting, uh, continually changes its uh, thickness. So then, uh, what became interesting was to think about this uh, in such a way that um, the, the sort of thickening areas would become structural, and then in other parts, this would just become a membrane, uh, and not in a way where you now introduce a new system of some kind of structure or columns or so that would carry this. Um, this, this, by the way, is, a, um, is the, the tail end of it, or the part that uh, goes out onto the ocean. And this would be uh, an area where the smaller commuter ships would be docking under. Um, this, uh, one other thing I omitted to say is that <clears throat> because the levels are continually changing, uh, 
it would be uh, a way of accommodating the various uh, and greatly varying scales of the ships uh, that dock here, uh, because their docking heights are all uh, drastically different from each other. Uh, but since arrivals and departures are uh, continually sloping, uh, you would be able to just dock at whatever height was um, happened to be appropriate. Um, this is a structure uh, that, that we sort of um, sketched out for the New York project, but uh, it, it actually um, would be something that uh, would work also with Yokohama, which is that we were thinking these layers um, would probably be constituted of a series of continuous Verendale type structures uh, that would have kind of their individual uh, uh, grains and, and scales somewhat, and they would run through each other. So, uh, each, for instance, each one of the colors in Yokohama uh, could have its own um, structural layer that would move through. So these portions would actually be um, structural in, this, in, the, in the way that you've seen the diagram. Um, this is a, a view back from the upper um, gardens. Um, this, this, this is a series of close-up uh, plans that show um, some uh, more specificity. Actually, there were three other um, terms that we were using, which are terms for uh, secondary systems in addition to the uh, surfaces and the kind of structural material. Um, one of them was uh, twisters, which are, uh, which are these kinds of conditions that, that happen through the operations we were doing. And what is interesting about those is that they, they become sort of sectional switchovers between levels. Um, um, and we were uh, in the glossary terming them as recurrent singularities in the surface space structure, which are twisted. Um, then the movers, uh, which are these kinds of things, um, and the board series of them here, you can see that they're sort of in the folds of the twisters, uh, and they were intended to be, um, as part of, of the kind of terminal program, uh, movers of um, persons, luggage, air, um, uh, any, any sort of thing uh, in, in that category. A secondary architecture of conveyors, escalators, conduits, etc., providing the speedy circulation of people, luggage, air, water, etc. Um, and the third category, were what we were calling footholds, is these small dots that you can see. Uh, and th those were um, prepared micro places such as outlets, brackets, anchors, taps, sockets, locks, etc., part of a field of the same, dispersed across and located on all surfaces for eventual or immediate furnishing, wiring, planting, etc. Um, and this is a, a, a cut on to the uh, parking level. Uh, this is the kind of drop off. And this is a waiting area below the drop off. Um, this is now the uh, Fifth Avenue project. Uh, just to look at you, we, we were asked to focus on two areas actually. One, uh, Northern Fifth Avenue, which is Harlem. This is Central Park for your orientation. Uh, and this is Marcus Garvey Park, which actually is a very nice um, urban park in, in Harlem. And um, there, were, there are many blocks here, there are quite a few blocks, which are completely, uh, basically empty. There are only a uh, few uh, brownstones standing. Uh, so in terms of this kind of horizontal occupation of a kind of larger horizontal space, um, there was certainly um, already plenty of opportunity here. Um, you can also see it um, in these diagrams, which, which are sort of sections. This is Marcus Garvey Park. Uh, and so here, these, these blocks you see are um, almost unveiled. Um, this is the lower portion, the area we were supposed to focus on, which is um, sort of below can't quite see it now, below 42nd Street. Okay. So mostly in this area, that's that being Central Park. And uh, what was interesting here, as you can see, is that there is a kind of, uh, at about 12 stories high, there's a kind of running data uh, throughout the blocks, which has to do with um, so zoning laws at that uh, period of time that these buildings were built. Um, so that, uh, we have 
uh, these, uh, we have the opportunity of establishing some kind of horizontal continuity at that 12 uh, foot datum, which is what we, um, what we looked into. This, by the way, is a kind of plan of um, the previous Virendale structural section that we were seeing. Um, so we um, employed or deployed a very similar structure to um, what you saw uh, before in Yokohama here. This is, uh, uh, again, the Harlem site, uh, with the intent that uh, those would be uh, tied in closely to uh, the infrastructures of the street that are going uh, all around here. And actually, one of the things that we absorbed here in Harlem while we were driving around was the fact that there was a lot of filming going on. And uh, we thought, uh, potentially, it might be interesting to speculate about these structures becoming occupied by the film industry um, uh, as large sort of um, studios and people like. Um, here you see a Marcus Garden Park. This is not a collage. This is an existing uh, swimming pool, a community pool. Um, and right here is 125th Street, actually. Here you see these, uh, these were completely empty lots. Um, this is now the way we were imagining uh, the midtown uh, blocks would operate. Um, and then that's sort of um, what I was indicating before as a 12 foot data line, which is uh, in this particular block um, right here. And then there are always some portions of other buildings that rise higher, uh, which, is, which is kind of interesting in itself because then they have uh, their own um, park up there. But, uh, essentially, the, the, the way we thought these would work would be that the vertical infrastructure that, structures that already exist here, and which, uh, which are uh, in any way uh, over-provided because these buildings, each one of even the smallest buildings have sort of elevator cores. So uh, this structure would par partly tie into the existing uh, infrastructures uh, and, and certainly would also have then uh, one or two legs coming down onto the ground of, of its own. Um, but the other issue that became interesting and valuable in this um, was the fact that um, these uh, older Midtown Towers uh, don't have uh, enough office area on, on each floor. Uh, they're in fact obsolete. And so we thought that in addition to uh, speculating about sort of more public probes that could happen in these um, top levels, one could also uh, suggest that uh, these uh, corporate environments would, would be able at those levels to actually rent out more space and expand their inefficient floor slabs. Um, so uh, like with Yokohama also here there are uh, into, it's not just uh, uh, the, the top that's exposed to the outdoors, but there would be pockets like this throughout the uh, various levels of all these horizontal structures that would be uh, aerated in this, in this form and, and they would be able to be occupied uh, for outdoor uh, programs as well. I think this is my last slide. This is the um, project we call Lobbying for Bit Parts. It was done in collaboration with uh, Krzysztof Woreczko, who is currently the um, director of MIT uh, Media Lab. But uh, as he says, that's not his day job. His day job is uh, being a projection artist. This was, uh, we were invited to do this by the um, Architectural League of New York um, with the uh, <coughs> National Endowment for the Arts grant. There were five sites. Uh, given throughout Soho, New York, actually the commercial sites, not uh, gallery sites. So there was everything from uh, the Angelica Film Cinema, which is what we're going to be looking at, and that was assigned to us, to Comme des Garçons, uh, uh, and uh, Dugal's photo processing, um, so forth. So that each of the five architect artist teams would develop um, their notions of architectures of display. Um, and what we decided to do, given the fact that we're in a cinema, uh, or actually several cinemas in fact, 
was to somehow extend the culture of film uh, across several layers of sight. So we established a kind of cine play. Uh, the cine play uh, establishes itself both in the theater, in the lobby, uh, at home, if you will, at work, uh, on the sidewalk. The, this is a diagram, a kind of cosecative map in and of itself which uh, here shows um, actually one <coughs> screen actually symbolizing six of them. There were uh, six uh, experimental robotic, robotic cameras uh, directed towards the screen so that uh, they could in fact scan eight inch by eight inches uh, of the screen of the entire screen. They are operated by uh, physicians in the lobby, which we call uh, lobbyists with uh, particular kinds of uh, lounging bits or invitations to play uh, the game itself. The, um, the lobbyists are located three buildings away, some 200 feet away uh, from the actual cinemas. The uh, more remote uh, positions that you see around here are actually um, locations that uh, we have supposed on the web. The, uh, this is the Angelica Cinema on the corner of uh, Houston and Mercer. Um, actually, let me go back just for a second. The, uh, interestingly, the owners of the Angelica Film Center are no longer the owners. Um, are, I mean, that is a story within itself. But uh, what happens here is that the uh, owners actually allow people to enter the cinema without paying uh, to get into it. So there's a kind of cafe free magazine publication and so forth, we decided to take that as a kind of cue of, uh, in fact, entering the cinema without, in fact, uh, necessarily participating in the seeing of the film to extend it uh, across these uh, different, uh, different areas of sight. The other thing that we did was to research 18th century lounging techniques. This one uh, happens to be called the drunkard's chair, and the chair is actually perfectly normative uh, chair that's been expanded one and a half times its scale. Uh, the reason for that is when you're drunk, uh, you can hit it more easily. Um, it's alternately called, I don't know if you can see this, a lover's chair. And I'll let you use your imagination for that. The roundabout uh, also has a kind of social protocol which is established in it in the sense that it pinwheels around. And each of the uh, participants in the chair actually are, in a certain way, forced to uh, converse with one another. Uh, the next is the Duchess chair, which is a regular chair, a foot uh, ottoman, and then a smaller uh, scale chair. So we saw we go through sort of tripling, splitting, uh, in, in certain ways, deformations of uh, each of these normative conditions to produce a kind of uh, social program within the chair itself, or within lounging techniques. Back to the Angelica Cinema, we took uh, bits of seats, the seat uh, itself, the backs of seats, the arms of seats, and uh, actually kind of perpetrated, if you want, the same mathematical uh, conditions, the tripling, splitting, uh, coevolutionary techniques that were established in lounging uh, relevant to the 18th century. And we got a somewhat different result. These are some of the studies that you see in the development of the lounging bits, which you actually will find uh, in the Angelica Cinema at each of the column uh, positions. So if you know uh, the cinema I'm talking about, there are five uh, huge columns with kinds of collars where people uh, can stand around. However, the column is so large that if you're standing here, you in fact can't see uh, the person across from you or hardly next to you. Um, we thought these would be perfect uh, invitation as entry points for our lobbyists. The, I, the way that these uh, are formulated are, of course, deformations according to these mathematical techniques with the intent that uh, not so much dictating the way in which people should converse uh, or they should be sitting inside them, but rather that uh, they invent their relations to them, both socially as well as um, uh, in terms of how they would be sitting in them. The, what you're seeing uh, and what is intended is actually this one is the one that, uh, at least the mold of it was built, um, they were intended all to be made out of uh, a modified acrylic uh, resin, which you'll see later on. Um, these are uh, actually attached at the, both in terms of the column and the collar. I should say that they are also co-evolved in terms of their 
mathematical procedures with the column itself. And this is as far as we got before um, the, uh, this is the mold uh, for, it's actually built in steel, it's a four-way cantilever with the profiles uh, that was ready to accept the uh, modified acrylic resin before, unfortunately just before this was completed, the owner uh, was caught uh, with, by his wife and daughters with his mistress in Khan. And uh, the project was canceled. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Uh, but we did get some shots of it, so you'll be able to see it. This is uh, what we would consider a lobbyist position. Uh, they're looking at a four uh, by five um, LCD screen, uh, which is right here, being held in their uh, hands. That, the, that is now operating a robotic camera, which is some 200 feet away. This is from a, a video that uh, you can see the different ways in people are in which people are uh, relating to these things. This is a particularly lounging mode. Um, suddenly decides to look at the film. The other thing I should say is happening as they are choosing these 8x8 eight eight portions of the film, these are all first run films that are being seen. Uh, the films are being then down, the choices made by the lobbyists unknown to them are being downloaded uh, by very powerful computers onto the internet. From the position of the internet, uh, you're allowed then to either upload your own film, your own personal minutia, uh, into the uh, into the website, uh, and from just different views of uh, this is the uh, monitor, the eight by inch, eight by eight inch uh, view he's looking at, and this is what you're seeing on the web. Um, so you can actually upload into these uh, slots your own uh, uh, versions of uh, film. They will then be um, downloaded uh, into, uh, again, by a very powerful computer, back into the Angelica and shown as previews of the, uh, uh, you can see one of them being shown right here, uh, previews of all six of the theaters. So these, the films that are being shown here have been collected around the, the world and then uh, placed back inside the Angelica as previous. So you never know exactly what you're looking at. The other aspect, uh, whether it be film or uh, simply the collections made from, uh, from everyone visiting the site, the other aspect of this um, is the text-based system, which is a new structure, a multi-user dimensional system, which uh, allows commentary on what you're seeing on the virtual uh, image website. And what happens is, this is a view actually of the screen, uh, you get a running dialogue of what, is, what appears to be subtitles in script with characters. Heaven uh, is a character, Thing is a character. Heaven uh, is from uh, Oklahoma, Thing is from Singapore. And uh, Heaven says, so this conversation is being projected. Thing says, yep, that's what they've told me. Heaven says, uh-oh. I guess I should be on my best behavior. This has always been a public discussion, given the fact that it's on the internet and on a multi-user dimensional system. Um, suddenly, when, it's, when the conversation is projected into a theater, the protocol through which these two engage each other changes. This is a project uh, that I'll, we, it was kind of a preview uh, of what is yet to come. This is a, a law school that we're working on, it's part of it is existing, uh, which is that. It's in an industrial park, which happens to be in a wetland, uh, aviary situation. So what you're looking at are parking areas, topography, of course. But that is the kind of uh, Z-shaped outline of the building. Um, and we're doing this in phases. So I'm only actually allowed to show you the moot court aspect of it. It's actually a 50,000 square foot renovation, which includes cafeteria, uh, library extension, uh, moot court, uh, some lobby uh, renovations, and landscaping. We were very interested in the fact that um, the, uh, the entire site, uh, or I should say the building, when you separate it into uh, surfaces, meaning floors, ceilings, walls, um, so forth, and scatter it throughout this huge uh, site in an industrial area that uh, is very common, of course, worldwide, but certainly in the United States. 
um, actually fill the surfaces of that building fill uh, the area of its site. Um, so that's one of the things that we started to uh, work with, was actually cast certain pieces of the, um, this happens to be the moot court, certain pieces of the floors and ceilings back into the site, uh, basically co-site them and roll them um, into what uh, would be now uh, the moot court. So the uh, you can see the kind of topographic lines that are uh, now rolled into one configuration of the existing area where the moot court would go. The uh, one uh, aspect of this particular moot court is that it is not simply used for practice trials. It's also used partly as a television station for other law schools to view the practice trials that are going on there, as well as a classroom. So it kind of does a, uh, somewhat of a triple duty. Um, this is what the interior started to look like in line. And this is what it looks like uh, when the double shell actually comes inside. This is the shell which is developed from that landscape. Also, I should have said the uh, seven uh, Supreme Court state justices of Massachusetts uh, will sit uh, in this court as well. It's uh, computerized, obviously. Um, also in terms of the projection of evidence. And it is, uh, as I say, a television station. These uh, walls provide a kind of psychorama. So because the shadow of the walls uh, is eliminated by these undulating uh, configurations, they basically, in, in television space, as it were, uh, evaporate. They, you cannot see them. You'll see a reverse shot of this in the next slide. And here you can see maybe the better uh, view of the shell inside the existing space, the audience, of course, and the uh, prosecutors and uh, defense attorneys. This is a project which we call the OK Apartment. It uh, actually has no significance other than uh, it is the letters of the, uh, the abbreviations of the client's names, Austin Kuttner. Um, this is a study, again, a kind of co-citative map, which takes a look at the normative structures of, bat, for example, bathtub, soap dish, sink in profile, uh, in basically cross-section relationship. The idea of that is that irregardless of uh, uh, scale or, or size, they are then related according to similarities. Similarities in terms of operation as well as form. What's produced uh, is five sites that we've located in the uh, two apartments, they're actually connected, um, which in this case, will, this is in fact a bed bath, uh, area. This is a wardrobe which becomes a counter, uh, and ultimately medicine cabinet. This is a kitchen bath area. This is a wall sill uh, piece which is actually the uh, kind of day bed uh, area as well as some um, uh, areas which deal with shelving. The first iteration is actually deal with sort of uh, resequencing, reshuffling of these different uh, identifiers in terms of their profiles. Um, the second aspect of the uh, networking system uh, or co-siting system which affords these uh, chimerical structures is to actually network them together in such a way that as you're working on one part of them, you're actually working on all of them on a different value structure. So that as you move one piece, you in fact move all. So this is the, just to orient you, this is the two apartments in terms of their divisions. That's uh, one of them, this is another. Um, the building originally was built in 1907. Um, it is an artist's uh, residence. It's located next to the um, Café des Artistes, therefore the Hotel des Artistes. Um, and interestingly, the history of the building is everyone from Max Ernst to Marcel Duchamp at one point lived there. Uh, they have kind of fantastic volumetric uh, studio spaces. The, um, the sites that I, were, I was mentioning, uh, here is the wall sill piece. This is the shower, kitchen area, bath. This is the uh, wardrobe piece and the uh, bed bath area. One thing that the, uh, in terms of the client's request uh, was that uh, these two areas be connected. Um, the way we did that was actually through movable uh, partitions, which are quite uh, large and rather heavy, uh, in fact. The other thing is that the apartment isn't quite a private residence. In fact, it's somewhat of a, kind of a corporate residence, if you want, or a public
public uh, residence in the sense that uh, they do a lot of entertaining here. It's a sort of care, care condition, but it's also afforded uh, clients of the several corporations' use uh, of in terms of a hotel. So this, in fact, is the hotel suite, the, uh, this relatively existing uh, bedroom and this uh, bathing area, which locks down, I'll explain that later. Um, or it actually uh, can become one apartment here or another apartment uh, there if, for example, uh, their children or friends uh, divide into uh, two apartments or, of course, it can be seen as one L-shaped apartment or one uh, apartment in total. Uh, this is a view of one of the computer uh, renderings looking back um, towards the uh, kitchen area the uh, shelving, shower unit. This is actually the division line where the uh, where you'll see the concrete uh, partitions actually aligning. Um, this is a bathing area. Here you see the wardrobe, which basically narrows to a counter behind the glass wall, then uh, becomes a sink and uh, medicine cabinet. The um, oops. So this is what it looks like built. Um, the, of course, this is aluminum glass. This is uh, fiberglass, and these are the concrete partitions. The blue, I should also have included in terms of looking at that as a site, and that's one of the reasons the deformations occur. The blue is epoxy, and it actually goes uh, up the wall. In fact, all the materials, uh, except for the aluminum, perhaps, would have a somewhat liquid uh, relation to each other. Um, meaning that they will bond uh, together. This is a study uh, model where you can see the, uh, the moving partitions, the rotating uh, table, which is primarily used for breakfast areas and formal uh, uh, dining conditions. These are the partitions which allow for the formal dining uh, table to align with that one and actually formulate what will be a 12-person uh, a uh, dining area. Here you can see where the bed and the bath merge uh, together across a glass partition. And this is uh, in entertaining mode, where both of the tables are aligned. Uh, and this is the wall sill piece, which I described earlier, which acts as a back, in fact, for either couch or uh, day bed. Um, Aaron. computer view, and this is what it looks like built. Um, here, this is the glass partition I mentioned. The, the, one of the constructs of this was really to deal with it as a sort of domestic scape, and therefore uh, become somewhat con continuous in the sense that uh, via these different profiles uh, being examined, there's a kind of excess of information. That excess of information uh, allows for an ambiguity between uh, spaces um, and also, in a strange way, uh, allows for the development of uh, notions of cavitation, interiority, um, so forth, that in, in our terms deal with this in terms of a deep space condition. This is section through uh, the, actually, the bed bath piece looking towards the wardrobe. And this is uh, actually looking at the bath area. Here you can see the glass partition or, or not. This is the sleeping area and of course the headboard is glass. The water actually form, forms a section at the at the headboard so that it uh, basically maintains a continuity between bathing and sleeping. Here's the, uh, actually the entryway into one of the apartments or the primary entry in, which is the faucet glass uh, bathing area and then the uh, aluminum wardrobe in the distance. This is looking uh, actually at the opposite side of that. Here you can see where the uh, sink narrows down to a counter and then expands into the uh, wardrobe piece. The wardrobe, this I should say is a stainless steel uh, sheath and the uh, wardrobe uh, and that piece is aluminum. This is uh, Australian lacework.
here you can see where the glass actually cuts back into uh, the bathing, uh, actually the bath sleeping area. In order to build this, what we did was, um, these are in a way the working drawings of it, the computer produced one-to-one -one profiles um, of the forms of these, and uh, we actually uh, cut them in the factory as stanchions, either out of plywood or aluminum, depending on what was needed. Uh, and that's what they started to uh, look like. They were then, uh, between them, we placed styrofoam in terms of making the mold. This is when the um, acrylic, uh, modified acrylic was actually being placed on it. It's all built as one piece, of course. Um, details in terms of cuts that you've already seen uh, placed inside the mold themselves. Um, this is just before it's being finished, where everything is checked, and now it has been sliced um, in order to get a sort of shiplap detail to, for water protection. It's built as one piece and then uh, cut, uh, numbered, um, and then rebuilt on the site uh, according to that uh, the map that I showed you. There are also stainless steel rods that were cast uh, inside the, the bottom pieces that would receive the, uh, the top section. So it's sort of like putting together a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. This is uh, it coming out of its mold, um, uh, finally. And this is the beginning of the, or actually sort of towards the end of the installation uh, of it on site. And here's just a couple more slides. This is uh, here, maybe get a better sense of the uh, sliding glass door and the, uh, the glass between the bed and the, uh, and the bath piece. Um, here's a different view looking towards the kitchen. The kitchen is relatively small um, in front of the kitchen and bath area. The, because it's a pit tear situation, this is not their um, main residence, although the, uh, the woman portion of the uh, client couple who is an artist and filmmaker was uh, talking about the fantastic uh, meals she would make in this two burner uh, kitchen. And her husband turned to me and said, my wife's idea of making dinner is making reservations. So <laughs> it seems to suit them fine. The, uh, this is a view, another computer rendering view, uh, looking towards the, the shower area. This is the uh, uh, extension of the table in, uh, in rotated position. This is what it looks like. This is the uh, entry piece here. You get a sense of the epoxy on the floor and walls uh, and the way in which it was uh, deformed. This is the pivoting table, which I was talking about for more casual uh, dining, the kitchen, of course, here. This is a rubber gasket, uh, which is on a door which pivots 180 degrees um, so that you can, it has basically three positions. This one, which closes off the bath, area, uh, the second one, another 90 degrees over, which closes, up, closes off the bedroom, and then of course, another 90 degrees opening it. Um, this is the uh, kitchen, uh, detail of the kitchen. This is also rubber gasketing, which holds cantilevering glass shelves. Uh, this is a cut, which, uh, and a sliding glass door, which is received in the bathroom, which that uh, cut receives the, uh, the lavatory. And as you open the door of the laboratory, you're actually giving yourself a mirror on the other side. Um, this is the, uh, the shower, uh, and this is another uh, door which pivots 180 degrees and has two different um, profiles, one interior, one exterior, and you see why that has to be. Um, this is a computer rendering again. The, that door has three stations as well, one to close the shower, one to uh, close off the bathroom, and then to fold back against uh, that profile. So it has to accept three different stations and two different uh, profiles. That's what it looks like, Bill.
again. This is that rubber gasket which receives that side. That's the aluminum wardrobe just to orient you at the other uh, apartment's bedroom area. This is the blue epoxy, the modified acrylic, and these are the cantilever glass shelves that actually extend through um, into those uh, pieces. The mirror that I was talking about is just off the photograph, and that's the laboratory which um, also receives it. And making the door is a very similar process in terms of the styrofoam. Just being molded on two different sides. And this is uh, just a detail of where the aluminum, fiberglass, glass, and epoxy all meet. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, 
you, you can set you can set the algorithms or the, the, the program to kind of generate a certain type of shape in one project where the shape isn't quite so uh, important of, of the final outcome. But for example, in the Yokohama project, you must have several very important things that you have to include um, you know, <coughs> instead of it just being, you know, w were they considered partic particularly? They were, but I, I also would almost say that um, from our experience, I would almost make the opposite argument. I, we found that, and perhaps that has something to do with the fact that, of course, the, the Parker project was ultimately built, the Kama was not. But uh, that in the, in the small scale, it, it becomes a more difficult issue because if you're getting sort of certain, because everything is uh, rather tied and relates to the body and so on, and for instance, with the bed and the bath landscape and so on, if you do get a lot of absurdity, it becomes uh, really not very viable. Whereas if you have larger surfaces and larger structures, if you, if you get certain quirkinesses, it, it seems that it's easier to accommodate from a programmatic point of view than it is in, in, in very sort of tight environments. I also say that it's not just about accommodating the, the program as much as allowing what you're getting. I mean, you, you sort of feed both into and out of what you're getting. So that certain kinds of inventions of program sort of make themselves evident to you by seeing what you're producing. And in a certain way, it's never with a completely in control posi position or knowing what you're going to get or what it's going to yield. But there's a, very much an idea of experimentation. And then from that experimentation, there's an idea of perhaps we have this great thing, and then what, what might it be? What really is its value? Nobody wants to know who built the apartment? Usually that's the... <laughs> uh, maybe in, in addition to the, um, to the questions that should be asked about the technology, which are you know, all interesting ones, and kind of almost always start with the first question, like, what's the software? It's kind of lead to more complicated questions. There's another kind of category of question, which might be something about the sort of look of the stuff, which I suppose we could talk about in terms of the technology, with domestic architecture, post-war American domestic architecture, like the Eden stuff. A certain kind of quality, of the, uh, like late 40s, early 50s, with the Eden that the word seems to resonate with, but also a kind of legacy of domestic appliances, like Sony Ray. You know, there's, a, there's a kind of um, peculiar thing that it's playing off of that's not being spoken about. It's a I'm wondering if there's anything you'd offer. Like, do you, do you talk about the look of the stuff? Like, do you look at certain things? Is there, um I think one, one way of responding is just uh, what we're very interested in is that the, the, the work is somewhat uncategorizable in terms of form. Yeah. Because we, we try to explore a, a multiple identity form, basically. Yeah, it's kind of hybridizing. It goes on and it also, which yeah. is also the same sort of ability to combine industrial products into another category of things. Yeah. In the Eames, uh, you're not the first one to make that relation to, to Eames. And I, the thing is, and uh, which, uh, which I, I think is a, is a good relationship to make, in fact, the difference, I think, arises a lot in terms of the expressed conditions of function, normally, within uh, what Eames is. Uh, it's, the, your question is not related to the question that came previously, that they were really designing for something in order to do something. And in a certain way, the, what we're interested in doing is providing a sort of excess of information that allows for even inadequacies because of its excessive uh, conditionings of a particular zone. For example, like the neighborhood transformations we were talking about. And uh, I think the, the, it's very interesting because when we, when we display the, the vehicle pieces in an art gallery in New York, which uh, normally, if you, if you display pieces as art, uh, the codification of walking into the room is that no one touches them. The, uh, the gallerist uh, had, was having fits because everyone was going around and picking them up and rubbing them on their bodies and sitting on them. And, uh, they felt, in, in, which was, <laughs> it was a very strange scene, but <laughs> uh, the, the, 
and she was worried about, of course, them walking out the door. This is New York, but the, um, but the other thing that they weren't being considered precious, which we, you know, like very much. Um, I think part of that has to do with they have a quality of familiar of f being familiar, even though they are completely unfamiliar, and it's exactly that locating the identity within that range, uh, which uh, which is in a certain way one of the values that we look for. But one thing about this question of <coughs> the excess that you uh, talk about, the kind of supplementarity of, of, of the work, still there is a moment at which one has to say, what are the kind of conditions that it leads to? At what point is it beneficial somehow? And what are the things that it, they're not, uh, that don't, don't work? But I think it's, 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 it's interesting that when, for example, in the 50s, the Smithsons were doing something like the House of Tomorrow or whatever the, the project was, where the, the basic kind of argument was that, in fact, the whole con condition of the construction of, of mass produced houses is, 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 is somehow dated, and they tried to make the analogy with the production of automobiles, where they made the argument for the replacement parts of the building so that you could actually change the inside of big parts of your house on a regular basis. If the car is somehow modified, why can't the house be modified and you basically change the element? And somehow the notion of, for example, the interior was already tied into a possible alternative possibilities for mass production and a kind of update. What I, for example, don't understand here is that when you deal with uh, certain modern plastics or things like this, they're still part of a, a kind of genealogy of uniqueness in a sense. For example, reproductivity doesn't seem to be something that's crucial ideologically in the project. We would say somehow this allows a certain level of supplementarity mm -hmm. where it, it, it has these benefits, but it also then, I, in terms of the polemics, mm -hmm. has a certain argument. I'm not quite sure what the, what the polemic of supplementarity is mm -hmm. in terms of, for example, the house. And one could pick on the relationship of the, of the, of the uh, addition for example, at the farmhouse and so on, and ask that uh, because of the fact that the emphasis seems to be on the formal development of this condition of supplementarity, but not it's actually economic, social, economic, political, this kind of attitude. And I'm sure they're there somehow in the work, but if you could maybe say something. Well, I mean, there, there, there was a very loaded question because there's several issues that you touch on. One is that, um, in fact, we are uh, quite interested uh, in, in the possibility of reproduction, um, although they, they, they are not necessarily apparent in these two projects, perhaps, because these have been one of the projects, but uh, we have been, I think maybe the, the vehicles uh, are more interesting along those lines, because we uh, did produce these pieces that um, were self-similar at different scales, but there were also various uh, generations of um, iterations of the pieces. And what, what is very interesting in working with this technology, both um, in, at the design end as well as at the production end, I think, is the fact that for the first time uh, we are faced with a situation, uh, or opportunity actually, where we don't have to think about uh, customization and reproduction, mass, re mass production, as two opposite ends. But in fact that we are able to mass produce any customers, uh, with a relative ease. So, in fact, uh, I mean, this is so you, you bring this up, but we had some um, uh, very, very initial talks with um, Owens Corning about uh, they are producing, uh, as you know, uh, fiberglass uh, prefabricated houses. Um, so uh, they're, they're sort of very interested in this. So right now, the way they're producing them, of course, is very much along uh, older paradigms of just um, repetition of the very same unit um, and identical houses. but. Um, so, in fact, we are uh, interested in this, in this other dimension. The, the, the difference is really in terms of it's actually a shift in the technology from going from purely mechanical reproductions in terms of making a mold and therefore an kind of assembly line condition producing. What we were doing with the vehicle pieces is actually each one of those is able to be customized and related as a kind of family uh, via a stereolithography process, which means quite simply that whatever we produce as a model on the computer is uh, built in a light sensitive resin of that um, immediately. In fact, the information uh, for, those, for, 
the vehicles was emailed uh, to a factory, an experimental prototyping factory in New Jersey. Um, and it takes me 35 minutes to get there by car. It, I, after we emailed it, I drove over there 35 minutes later, they were all produced, um, all in different uh, So it gives you some idea of the speed at which uh, this customization actually can take place. In terms of the, the house, for example, another issue, the, um, something that we didn't focus on today, but the, the house is actually part of, a, of an entire compound. Uh, it's, we're going to be doing the entry gatehouse, the pool house, uh, extensive renovation in addition to the barn, um, and all the molds that are built in the landscape uh, will be reused uh, again for um, those uh, different configurations. But so there won't be one-offs in that sense. With, mod with modifications. Again, there, there is that issue, actually, because uh, it's a kind of uh, limited site, um, that part of it is also driven by pragmatics. There were certain pieces and, and parts of the larger pieces that were more free to be, uh, to be played with, and others were uh, located um, you know, because there, there, were, there were plumbing connections, things like that. I mean, so the, the 